very good evening to all our members of Flow Chennai, members of the press, GP members, and past chairs on this call. Welcome to yet another inspiring speaker session at Flow Chennai. Before we start this evening's event, I would like to inform you that our next webinar will be on September 17th with Mrs. Preeti Rati Gupta, promoter of Anand Rati Group, on the money trail and being financially fit. And now coming back to our event for this evening, our guest for this evening is Mr. William Nanda Bissell. Also known as the accidental entrepreneur, he steered the growth of Fab India exponentially into a relevant and purposeful made in India brand. We look forward to some insights of his strategic and intuitive entrepreneurial journey over the last few decades and his learnings along the way. He will be in conversation with Sharon Rao, who is an art gallerist and entrepreneur herself. Thank you, Sharon and Vidya for making this event possible. And now I would like to hand over to Priya to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Rinku. Good evening, everybody. And it's uh, an honor to have such a fantastic guest and entrepreneur through whom we can learn a lot of stuff. And it's, it's my pleasure to introduce him as well. Before doing that, um, I would like to touch upon some of the tech etiquette, as we always do. This event will last approximately about an hour, and there will be a question and answer session at the end of the call. If you have any questions uh, for our speakers, please submit them via Q&A feature on the Zoom screen, and we will get them um, read out to the speakers during the Q&A session. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening. And also one last request, if there's any background uh, you know, noise that you have at your places, please do put your um, screens on mute mode so that we don't hear your wonderful background noise. Thank you very much for that. So William Nanda Bissell is a chairman of Fab India and has steered the company's retail growth and product diversification over the last two decades. One of India's most successful contemporary lifestyle retail chains, Fab India, is known for its focus on the craft-based products, creating job opportunities and generating livelihoods in the craft sector across the country. It's been particularly successful in bridging the rural-urban divide, creating access to urban markets for rural-based artisans working with traditional skills. This commitment extends to Fab India Group, Organic India, recognized as the world's leading source of authentic organic products and supplements that actively supports natural, sustainable, organic agricultural practices and livelihood across rural India through its wide network of farmers and tribal wild crafters. In 1988, after graduating from Westland, William set up the um, Bharad Rajan Artisans Trust called BAT, an artisan cooperative of leatherworks and weavers based in the state of Rajasthan. The original trust now operates uh, a rural school in the same area with over 450 students and an emphasis on quality education. Between 1990 and 1999, William experimented with different forms of community ownership, an experience that deeply influenced his approach to suppliers and supply bases where he took over as a managing director for Fab India in 1999, a position held till 2018. William lives in Delhi with his wife and two children. He is an avid reader and passionate about the environment, the active role of good governance in businesses and community building as a social responsibility, subjects that he talks about on a regular basis. And moving on to our moderator, member for this conversation, Sharon Aparao. Sharon has been associated with visual arts for over three and a half decades, working primarily with art from India. She's known to work with young, very young art artisans, putting them on a map of art. She has been acknowledged and followed keenly for her sense of aesthetics and sharp eye in picking up the best artists and giving them the platform and confidence to shape themselves for future. Having worked with well-known artisans very, very early in her career, her exposure allowed her to work overseas with Indian art when it was hardly known. Today, her outreach allows for the crafts and artisans uh, and the ancient arts of India to be shared in lectures, workshops, and destination lectures. We look forward for an engaging conversation between these accomplished entrepreneurs. And now over to you, Sharon. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction and welcome, the, uh, welcome William to FLO and welcome to our uh, webinar. So, uh, you know, I've known you for many years and I've known your father and mother too. And my first memory is hearing your dad talk at one of the Crafts Council events and I was so inspired and so excited and you know it was something new because everybody thought about the uh, uh, the khadi fabric and handloom fabric as something that was not so fashionable and of course today it's different and your dad was one of the pioneers in bringing it to our lives and making it what it is today he was one of the first baby steps that that happened to the handloom industry and of course you came along and allowed it to grow into this fabulous brand. So it's become something that all of us uh, see every day. We all are part, uh, Fab India is part of all of our lives in one way or the other, whether it's for the home, whether it's the dining table, whether it's our clothes. And we're all so proud to have such a fantastic brand that is an indigenous brand for us in India. So. And everybody, of course, wants to know how you grew this and how you made this uh, fantastic uh, brand and what it took to make it. So when we talk about scaling up, William, what is it that you really need to scale up? Can everybody scale up? Or is it something that's particular that can be scaled up? Tell us, just give us everything. Thanks, uh, Sharon. I I wanted to just start by uh, thanking Priya for that very generous introduction and uh, for Rinku for setting this up. This is really uh, quite a nice form and I, and I really appreciate during this COVID time, you're all thinking up all these interesting ideas. Um, I, uh, um, you know, Sharon, I, I think uh, you and I probably share the same ideas on, on the ingredients uh, for what makes a successful idea become a successful business. Uh, I mean, I, these days, I get one idea a day in my mailbox from you know, an entrepreneur somewhere in the country who's heard of me or who's heard, knows someone who knows me and they send you a, a really interesting proposal. And you know, some of them you can tell right away are not going to go very far. And, and it's interesting when you reflect on what, what creates a what converts an idea into a successful business, I mean, it, it really, I think, hinges on three things. And, and I think the most, the first thing is, is really the most fundamental, which is, do you sense there is a demand for something? Um, and, you know, it, the, people get very passionate about their ideas. And the, sometimes that passion can blind you to the fact that there might not be uh, much demand for your idea. Like uh, yesterday, I got a really interesting proposal from someone um, who was creating, you know, uh, bags from recycled waste. And it, it, it sounded like a very, very good idea, but uh, I didn't think there was going to be any demand for those kind of bags uh, because people who are going to spend money are not going to want to use a bag made out of recycled waste at that price level. So there were many things wrong with the idea, but I could sense that the entrepreneur was so passionate about their idea that they really didn't focus on, on the on whether there was any, on, on the kind of demand that there was for that idea. The other thing is that, I think that one of the things that really is the glue in, in, in any entrepreneurial idea is what the purpose of that idea was. Why, why is the idea being set up? I mean, other than just looking at the immediate demand, what are you planning to, you know, you know what is the vision for that idea? Now, uh, recently I had some entrepreneurs come to me um, and they wanted me to be involved with their startup, which was a, a gaming company. But it was really a, a very violent, purposeless game. And I just thought to myself, gosh, this is not something I really want to be involved with. I want to spend any time on. Or, you know, so as an idea, it had no purpose. It had no higher purpose. Their only thing was that we make a game, we'll get X number of views, and we'll get some advertising, we'll get some revenue, and then somebody will buy us out. And so to me, if you ask them what their vision and purpose for the business is, it, it would be just to make money. And uh, so that was something that, you know, I, I think that in today's day and age, especially with, without the way I see young people around the world and their, their focus and ideas, I think that 
you really need to connect your business with a higher purpose. And, and lastly, uh, this is to me a very fundamental thing that I see happen over and over again, that there has to be an absolute focus on the unit level economics. I mean, what are you, I mean, recently I, I uh, some really bright entrepreneurs came to me, they were setting up a chain of these, these kind of um, souped up coffee shops, really exciting idea and all. And they had set up a few of them and I could see that their unit level economics were very poor. And their idea was that if we, if we get funding, we'll make 200 of these and when and miraculously, they will all become profitable. But when I asked them to connect the economics of one coffee shop with their bigger business idea, they didn't have clarity. They were very good, their pitch deck was perfect. It was beautifully designed. I mean, everything, these guys are really smart. They've been to the best universities, but you know, when, when I tried to probe them on, on their unit level economics, I mean, what, how much does each coffee shop make? What are the terms going to be? How many, you know, and what is the profitability at the coffee shop level? Because if you open 200 loss making coffee shops, you take the loss of one and you multiply it 200 times. And, and at that point I could sense that their business model was not really uh, sustainable. And so I think that it's a combination of, of these three things, you know, starting with, you know, is there really demand for something? I, I see so many ideas that there, I realize there's just no demand for this idea. There's none that I can see. And most of those businesses sadly um, don't go very far because the entrepreneur doesn't, doesn't focus on, you know, do people need my product? Is there, is there really a desire for what I'm doing? Um, the second, like, um, like right now, there's, there's a very interesting company that came to me that's doing uh, complete vegan products across the country. And they're doing, they're starting with vegan butter, vegan milk, vegan. And um, that was, you know, a, to me, a great, a great idea. I mean, I could see that there would be demand. I mean, demand is going to be a niche segment demand, but it's going to grow rapidly. So that was to me a very exciting idea, but there are lots of other ideas about uh, of every 10 ideas or pitch decks I receive, I can sense that at least eight of them don't really have very strong demand. So those businesses are going to fail from the get-go, from the beginning. The second thing is that I think as an entrepreneur, you have to connect with your higher purpose. I mean, your mojo, because I mean, you're, ever since I met you, uh, Sonu, you've been passionate about art from my first meeting. So you converted your passion and you love the art and you love to spend time with the artists and you love to find new talent. And, you know, I, um, and, and, and you translated that into a successful business. So, to me, I mean, it, it, you have to have that passion because if you're not connecting with your inner passion and your higher purpose, the business is just going to be hard work for you. And lastly, I would, I know this sounds very boring, but the unit level economics are ultimately where you live or die. Yeah. So the balance sheets do count at the end of the day, you know, those days of just IPOing and getting money is gone. I mean, you have to have a purpose and you, you have to balance the books at the end of it. So tell me what are the other, what are the, the finer points in scaling up? Like what are the different to do's and not to do's when you're scaling up? If provided you have the first three that you've talked about. So the first three are really your ingredients. I mean, without those ingredients, you can't make your lasagna without the pasta and the cheese and all. So those are your ingredients. Then how you cook those ingredients is really what, what you talk about when, you, when you're looking at scaling up. And, and I think that, that uh, the first part of scaling up is really to, to do a lot of ideation. Um, and, I, and I feel that there's one area where entrepreneurs don't spend enough time um, uh, is to collect a group of people whose opinion you respect and create an advisory council. I'm always setting up advisory councils. And people often say to me, but you know, you don't need an advisory council. I'm like, yes, I do need an advisory council. We all need them. And so I'm always setting up advisory councils and giving members of the advisory council equity or, you know, I mean, because I think the ideation part is really important because once you've got a business that looks like it's beginning to turn and, and go somewhere, you really need to have a very good small council to help you ideate. And um, I've seen the weaknesses of businesses that don't have that. From ideation comes your, your strategy, really. I mean, and the strategy word has been so overused, but strategy to me is what is the road you're gonna to take to climb the mountain? 
are you going to go up this way or this way? And why are you picking that particular route to climb up the mountain? Like, I mean, again, I, I think there are some fantastic, you know, I mean, I would just look at your example, you know, when normally you'd always go to an art gallery to buy art, but I would go to an art gallery maybe once every two years, but I go to the Lodi hotel every day. When I was part of the gym, I used to go there every day and I would every day walk by and every day I'd spend 15 minutes looking at your art. So you made it as such because it was on my, on the way to the gym. And every day you tell a story about the artist, the new artist who came and what inspired them. So to me, the strategy is key because if you stick your art in an art gallery in a part of town, which nobody really visits, then you know, you might get 10 footfall a week. Um, so strategy for me is, is really, really important. Like one of the things we did in retail, which turned out to be a game changer before the COVID hit, was that we started, we created these experience centers. So we have them in, in Chennai, in, in uh, Bangalore, in Delhi, in Pune. And, um, and they, they were a huge success before the COVID epidemic hit. We had a children's center, we had a cafe, we had an, a wellness center, we had an alterations center, and it transformed retail. So suddenly, our store level economics went from say having a store level average store level profitability of say 32 to 33 percent we suddenly went to 42 to 43 percent so there was a 10 percent increase in store level profitability because people came they spent more time they came with their families they met their friends and it became a kind of community space uh, especially the ones you know we had in the the one the two we have in chennai have done exceptionally well. Um, and then, of course, COVID is an aberration because right now people are not meeting other people. But I'm sure that when this period is over, they'll go back to being, it'll go back to being a good strategy for the business. The third area is the focus on execution. And, uh, you know, the relentless focus on execution is, and what we did a few years ago, we realized that we brought in outside consultants to run the execution piece of the business for us. Because we didn't have the expertise in-house. So we used outside consultants to run what, what is called a program management office. So what a PMO does is basically it, it says, okay, what are you trying to do? and How are you trying to do it? And then it monitors everybody. It's like a monitoring office that says, okay, this was supposed to happen on the 15th of January. This was supposed to happen on the 25th. And basically they really pull the execution part together. And and they serve as an early warning system if something is going late. And for so me, all the systems, the systems get in place with a with a PMO like that. Yes, and a PMO is really vital if you want to scale because your own people are not good at monitoring your own people. Because in an organization, there are relationships. You like some people, you don't like other people. You get along. You want to, you know. So when you have people monitoring each other, even heads of departments or whatever. You, positions, titles you might give them, they don't do a, as good a job as someone coming in from the outside with the kind of experience that they have at PwC Consulting or KPMG or Deloitte or all these guys, AT Kearney. They actually do this day in and day out. They run program management offices. Um, and so, and if you can give them a stake in, in making sure they do the implementation, then they actually have to sit there and they have to sweat along with the teams. And you know, pull them together. So I think for execution, something like that is is very important because if you if you don't if you're having to monitor the execution yourself, unless you're very small, when you reach a certain point, it's very difficult to do that. And lastly, it's the quality of your monitoring, your analytics, your learning, um, and how you how the feedback loop works between your learnings and the change that you bring. Um, for example, we get uh, 600 uh, customer um, messages a day between social media and our you know, handwritten books in the stores and all. We collect 600 messages a day from customers. Now, that basically, those messages go into a system and we look for trends and we look for themes. And then, of course, you look for but those, that's a very important feedback loop because, you know, you'll get a message saying that, you know, uh, if this store is very hard for disabled customers. So in that store, we put in a chairlift. You get, you know, you get these kind of messages and you need, you need a mechanism by which you can receive this signal 
and then convert it into an action, assess it and convert it. And there's also a lot of learning. I mean, now, of course, on social media, there's a lot of user generated content. So it can both be very positive and very negative. So you have to basically hear what customers are saying and you have to use your own internal analytics. And this is again, where a program management office comes in is that they take the, we take the internal uh, analytics and, and adjust their programs accordingly. So this kind of an ecosystem where you have ideation, strategy, execution, and then finally monitoring and learning, this is part of a very, um, very powerful ecosystem that I have found has worked very well for us. That's fantastic. And what about the challenges? What is it that has not worked? Where have the challenges been? What is it that you found difficult? Um, I think that uh, the biggest challenge that uh, we face is that it's hard for, as you grow, to, to be able to be focused on the customer and their needs. Because as, as organizations grow, they become internally focused. And this is true with every single organization. So you start by being externally focused and you become internally focused because you have all these processes and systems and people begin to report to people inside the organization. And basically they, they stop looking so much outside. I mean, I, I'll give you the, the story of a very well-known uh, a business. Um, I won't take their name because you all know this business very well, but uh, I met a trainer, a friend of mine who's a very well-known trainer. And I said, oh, where are you going? He said, oh, I'm going off to Goa. I said, oh, great, what are you doing? I'm leading a workshop there. And this was January. And, and it was uh, at a hotel and um, owned by this group. And I was like, wow, they're doing a, this big training. Yeah, he said, they're calling all their people from all over the country and all that. And I said, but, but you know, in January, it's kind of like peak season for them, isn't it? Revenue time and all that. Yeah, but he said, they're calling all their bosses. So and this was many years ago. I don't think they would, they would do this now, but I was just think that's, an, that's a mindset because you take over the best rooms in your best hotel in Goa in January when it's peak season because you are looking after your bosses and you're running training programs and, and it suits everybody to fly down to Goa for a, a workshop in, in January. But that's what happens inevitably with larger organizations. And the challenge is to kind of figure, have people look look towards the customers and look at the market with fresh eyes all the time. And I think to do that, larger organizations have to constantly break into smaller groups. And uh, I call them moonshot groups, you know, which, which where they focus really on a project, on the customers. And for example, we have a moonshot group going on in the company right now, which is run by a very small team. And actually when the team reaches its peak size, it's only gonna be 15 people. And um, it's a moonshot group to create a new kind of e-commerce, but it's being done at arm's length from the company. So, and we've told the people in the moonshot group that look, if, if this moonshot works, then we will spin it off into a separate company and you will all get equity in the company. Because I realized that these kind of moonshots cannot be done inside a main business, which is more like a franchise. And a, there was a, a very interesting book by a man called Safi Bakal, who, who wrote about why, larger companies have such trouble being innovative because they, they basically kill innovation. And actually, if you look at almost every innovative idea, it's come out of a large company, but the large company hasn't been able to make something of it. I mean, basically years before digital film had been invented, Kodak had actually created digital film and then it killed its own idea. So basically it had the idea of the future and then killed it. And there are so many instances of this in the world of business that happen over and over again, because large companies, they might have all the good ideas, but the, the internal dynamics and politics are such that they face it. In, in terms of a challenge, I think that is the greatest challenge that you know, any larger business faces that um, I, I'll, I'll, give you, uh, I'll give you another idea of a very large business. I, I used to be a gold card member of this business and then I stopped using them and I became a silver card member. And, Again, I got a letter from the chairman saying, congratulations and welcome to the Silver Club and all. And I'm thinking to myself, this is typically the behavior of a big business because what the chairman should have been not sending me the letter of being welcome to the Silver Club, but why did you go from being a gold member to being a silver member? And, 
and you've been a gold member for so long. And, and again, it's a large businesses just don't have that sensitivity. So somebody has created a template and everybody just hits the send button on the template and it goes out, hundreds of those letters go out and there's no thought, there's no caring, there's no feeling. It's just all automated. It's all a process. So I get a nice letter from the chairman saying, welcome to the Silver Club. You're going to have all these wonderful benefits and all that. But actually, I was a member of the Gold Club and nobody focused on that. So I think the challenge before a larger business is that if you don't, and today's age has become hyper, you know, the response times have to be really quick. And if you don't respond like that, you know, the business can be extinct very quickly. And large businesses are actually today much weaker than small businesses because they're like a very tall tree and, you know, uh, their center of gravity tends to be quite high. So even if there's a slight wind, it can knock it over. And consumer demand can change almost overnight on, on a product. Um, you know, you can see this with Johnson & Johnson with their talcum powder. You know, it took just one or two bad stories and it changed the tide on that. So I think business, larger businesses have in fact much more to lose than smaller businesses. Um, they have to be much more susceptible to you know, they have to be much more careful about what consumers are thinking. So that's in it. The other challenges are all, you know, I mean, there's some challenges to do with, you know, once in a while government policy, once in a, but those are not, those are nothing. They exist in every country. They exist in every situation. I wouldn't, but this to me is a real human challenge of scaling a business. You know, I like what you said about fresh eyes and you were the fresh eyes for Fab India. And that's why you were able to see all these levels because sometimes when you're building something, you don't see this kind of, you don't see it like this. And when you are part of it and yet you're not part of it because you're the next generation, you see things differently. So I, I like that. I like that quote, fresh eyes. So that's I think one way uh, to keep a set of fresh eyes is to do things that are unrelated to your business all the time. And I think here is, uh, you know, when most people grow up in, say, a business family, they are steeped in a tradition of doing business, of understanding business, and, all, and they're brilliant at it because they've seen it from when they were children and at the table in the evening, their parents talked about it and all that. But I think it's very important for people to step out and just do something completely unrelated. Like, I remember once I went to see an Ayurvedic doctor many years ago, and he was able to tell me so much about my character, my personality, my, who I was just with one meeting. That firstly, I thought he was a fake. I mean, and then when I started spending more time with him, I realized that he, he taught me about a whole different way of looking at the universe and looking at things. So I think it's things like this that expose you. So then I had this experience and I read a number of books on Ayurveda. I went and met a lot of Ayurveda charyas. Sadly, many of them have passed away and most of their knowledge has gone with them. And many years after this, I encountered a company called Organic India that was dealing with herbs in a particular way and trying to preserve the prana of herbs. Now, if I hadn't had that experience with the Ayurvedas, I wouldn't have had any idea what they were talking about. And this is years before anybody even recognized these herbs. This is years before turmeric, ashwagandha, brahmi became like the super, you know, hits they've become today. Um, but because I had this experience way back in my past and I connected the dots and I I heard them talk about how important it was to preserve the prana of the herbs and, and all that. And because I knew a couple of uh, very good scientists, I, I went to them and I said, is there anything, what do, what do you mean when does a herb have a prana or whatever? And they said, look, in scientific terms, it will be the polyphenols and the bioactives in the herb. And we, there are ways that we can do particular kinds of analysis and measure these. So I took those herbs to those scientists and they said, you know, the herbs the bioactives in these herbs are at a very high level. They are expressing themselves at a very, very high level. And, um, and basically, um, there, there's because when we look at the herbs available in the market, the bioactives are at a fraction of the concentrations that, that you're picking up in these herbs. And these were grown organically and processed in a particular way. So then I got involved with this company and one thing led to an, another. And then today we are the majority shareholder of this company. It's called Organic India. And in the last few years, it, it was a company that had very low sales and, and was losing money. But then in the last few years, it's really as, as people have moved towards uh, wellness and holistic healing and all, it's, been, it's become 
you know, a company that has, uh, today I think we're, we are the largest organic player in the country. That's fantastic. So that brings us to this, the most important thing that I think a lot of people are talking about today, and that's sustainability, which you as Fab India have mastered this entire mantra of sustainability. The, uh, the, you know, working with the indigenous artisan, working with companies like this. So tell us a little bit more about the ideas of sustainability that you have been able to package for your brand and that you brought on to brought out on your shelves in in a in a way that's it's easy for us as buyers to come there but how did you actually how did that whole thing evolve you know i i feel that it has it has to do with your passion i mean if you are you know i grew passionately interested in organic agriculture through understanding of ayurveda and then through understanding i i got involved with that. I was already interested in craft because I had a passion for it. I grew up with it. I, you know, I saw it growing up and I had an understanding of it and a passion for it. And so, so it's really about how you connect your passion with, with something bigger, because if you don't have a passion, then you have a problem because you, you're really then doing it. Um, it's just a job or you're doing it to you know, have a valuation or to make some money or, or for whatever reason that you're doing it. But it's not really connected to your passion. So I would say the first step in that journey is to really figure out what your passion is. Yeah, I think this passion story is important because you sleep it, you dream it. And I think it's so, that dream is so important, isn't it? I mean, you know, that takes you, that takes you very far because you don't, for you, then it's not a chore. You're enjoying it. Then, you know, you're talking to someone else and talking to a third person about it. Even the person next to you on the flight, if you, if you can get, uh, get a common ground, you you end up having a great conversation. So I think this passion takes you up to a great extent. I'm, I mean, it's it's quite amazing. Thanks. So have you left have you left out anything else that is important that you should be telling us about your story? I'd love to hear from everybody else. Actually, I think I'd, I'd be very interested in hearing from everybody else. So I don't know how you do quite Q and A. Yeah, yeah, we'll 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 do this. Thank you. This was this was very good. So shall we get to what some of our friends want to ask? And Rinku, do you want to take this onto the questions? You're yes. muted. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, William. That was really insightful and so new, as always from the heart, and especially when it comes to things of passion. No one can beat you at it. So th there is a question which I have over here which says, do you think the pandemic has taught us new lessons in entrepreneurship? And did you ever consider going completely online or the e-commerce route? So, you thank you. Actually, that's a very interesting question because um, everybody tells you today, if you don't go on the e-commerce route, you don't have a future. And I, and I tend to agree with them. But I also feel that the e-commerce market in the country is being dominated by, you know, a few very large players with really deep pockets. Now, we all know who those players are, but they're really, it's, it's a game in which uh, they, their strategy is to get maximum number of people transacting on their site. And the way they do it is that the Nivea cream you buy, they give you a 25% discount on it. And, you know, it, it's a very attractive model, especially if you have large sums of money to spend. That's not the case with us, and uh, or most. That's not the case with ninety nine point nine nine percent other businesses. So, you know, when we looked at e commerce for two years, I didn't do anything. I mean, we had a small website and it did a tiny amount of sales, but I didn't want to go into it unless I we knew what we wanted to do and how it connected with who we were as a company. So it took two years to figure it out, and we have now um, launched. We are about to launch a marketplace which is very different from what exists out there. In fact, we call it a platform because it's a platform for ideas and for, and it's really going to be a site that maybe at most we will have 4 million people in the country who are passionate about this site, but that's our entire addressable market. We are not trying to appeal to 200 million people or the entire middle class or whatever. That's for everybody else to do. So we will focus on this area and we will create something, you know, truly, of value to those people. And the idea is that if we can, if we're successful with our marketplace, it's not going to be the amount of people who come to our marketplace. It's going to be 
the their loyalty expressed in you know, the you know the customer lifetime value so you know if we look at having 4 million customers each doing you know 10000 or 15000 rupees a year i mean that for us is going to be a huge business opportunity and so we are not you know our goals are very finite they're very in a way you could call them limited we don't we, but within that i think we have found a niche where these other players are not going to play the biggies are not going to come so basically the e-commerce market is individual brands have their e-commerce sites and then you have the biggies out there and everybody who is in between has been wiped out so you will have an amazon you'll have a flipkart you'll have a reliance you'll have a tata click and you'll have four of them and maybe paytm at some point will enter so uh, so you'll have four or five players at that at that level and then you'll have a lot of small individual brands who are each playing you know so if you want to go to that brand's website you'll go there but it will be exhausting for a customer to remember 500 brands you know, so they'll probably end up buying that brand's products on say an amazon so where we come in is it we are we have a curated platform which is which brings together ideas and products and um allows you to be it, it's a very unique i don't want to tell you more about it because it's launching in in literally a month and a half and um and it's being designed and built by the same person who built indigo airlines i mean who built indigo airlines from a tiny to to you know one of the world's fastest growing airlines uh, aditya ghosh and he joined us because he was so excited with this idea of the platform so he joined the board of fab india and he's leading this whole initiative so so we are going to launch this uh, in stages starting in october and i think it should be very exciting great we really look forward to that priya do you want to take any questions from yeah. the queue um i've got few questions coming up so i'll start off with the last one first um so this question is from shruti she's asking as a startup in home space how must one toe the line between investing and returns on investment especially when you're working with artisans while keeping your collection interesting and not stale so having regular product launches that is exciting for customers wow uh, so shruti um the, the the hardest thing about a home business is the working capital cycle uh and it becomes even harder if you're working with artisans because your working capital cycle becomes 6 to 9 months which is which places a huge strain on any business um so if there is a way you, you the only way you can get around that is to use technology to see if there's a way you can actually minimize your working capital while you're actually servicing your customers orders so um i was just um advising uh, uh a person on a business and i said look don't convert anything keep your raw material and ensure that your raw material can be resold in case you don't get a sale on it because as soon as you have a long working capital cycle your business becomes very very heavy and then uh, planning for the future and managing growth it becomes very expensive so if there is a way to shorten your working capital in this case i said you know keep the yarn ready and keep some fabric and keep some product but under invest in that and as you get orders you convert and for that you will have to be very quick about converting your online orders into pr- production pieces and you need to really focus on your unit and whether you can tell. so this lady went ahead and created a unit which works 24 hours a day and she can convert it i mean literally uh, and if an order comes in on a monday it can be converted and shipped out on a wednesday so she's actually achieved what i would call a negative working capital cycle which is really good because she gets 60 days from her from her suppliers and basically is able to turn it around and because it's it's done on the net uh she gets a payment right away i mean it takes a day for the credit card to get processed so so i think i would look at truthy those kind of models because anything else requires a large amount of working capital thank you so uh, just to summarize it is more about uh, you know getting that online piece ready when they have to do a you know quick turn around is that what Yes I mean um there are two problems one is that if you start forecasting demand and and you create let's say 20 let's say 20 desks and and only six sell it's very hard to sell things today at a discount 
you have to sell at a substantial discount. That's been one of the changes that has taken place with the consumer. So that combined with a long working cycle, like I was, uh, I've advised someone else. I said, look, don't set up your own business, create an app and sell it to all the interior designers in the country. And so that if they need your product, uh, they can use that app and they can contact you and you, you do it like that because keep your working capital as light as possible because your business is very spiky. You might get an order for 30 lakhs one day and then for the next two weeks, you might have no orders. So don't keep a business where you have a fixed overhead and a working capital cycle. Uh, and I must say this, this lady has taken her business and actually done something very interesting with it. And a lot of interior designers use her business. Um, and she actually, nobody knows her name. Nobody knows the name of the business, but they, they do all the like blinds, curtains, they do a lot of back-end products for very, very high-end projects. So hotels, houses, you know, where the budgets are huge, uh, basically, you know, the, she does a lot of film star houses and, and all, but it's a very successful business and it's a very profitable business, but it's a business that nobody would know the name of. Great. Thank you for that, uh, William. So our next question is from uh, Pritika Chari. Uh, how do small businesses run by one woman scale up? Often the advisory committee is family and friends. Should they get external consultants? Consult Moonshot group. Moonshot group. Sorry, uh, Rinku, I lost uh, just the last, uh, oh, sorry, Priya, I lost just the last uh, few seconds of that question. Yeah, so her last part of it, should they get external consultants and moonshot groups to grow? So, um, a friend of mine uh, asked me the same question and my advice to them was that, look, there's a lot of very good forms that exist. Um, there, there are uh, the Indian Angels Network is a fantastic form. I have, I know at least ten businesses that have been incubated from the Indian Angel Network where they got their own advisory group. Uh, in fact, um, they got some of the best business minds in the country to um, to advise them uh, through the Indian Angels Network. There are other informal groups that are operating, but there are also these very interesting tutorials and sessions you get. Um, that I exist. I mean, another friend of mine is just enrolled in a in a program which he found very helpful with Rahul Jain, someone who does this. That there are many other people who do this. I think when you grow to a larger size, that's when you can set up a formal advisory council because a formal advisory council you really need to pay them, and in the beginning you might not be able to afford to do it. Great. And uh, next question is from Hena. She says, um, it's a suggestion more than a question. I'm a diehard fan, uh, diehard Fab India customer. Moved away from clothes, that is the quality. Moved to home products only because the staff of the store were fantastic. Need to have centralized discount center where all your odd pieces surplus are kept. So that's a question that she's asked. A suggestion. What a suggestion she's given. Yes. So I have another question coming up. Just sorry, can you just repeat that question again? It's more of a suggestion than a question. Yes. Uh, I'm a diehard Fab, Fab India customer, moved away from clothes, the quality. And she put a, a sad smiley, moved to home products only because the staff of the store were fantastic. You need to have a centralized discount center where all your odd pieces, surpluses are kept. So, um, on the centralized discount center, we now keep it all on the website. So if you go to the website and there's any special discounting being done is kept on the website. I think it's really sorry that you, I feel very bad that you had that experience with the quality of the apparel, but I can assure you that if you go back there now, I mean, and you will find that there's a different, I mean, we've, we've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years working on the quality. As you know, the products come from many, many different places and uh, they have to go through a lot of processes, very hard to keep consistent quality when they're made in such small units across such wide geographies. But in spite of that, we've really tried the last few years. It's been really my, uh, almost my number one project to try to change that. So if you can, if you can go there now, I'm going to send you my email address. If you can go there now and tell me if you're still having problems then I'll personally get involved. I'm, I'm just putting my email address on your chat box. Uh, 
That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. While you're typing that, I have another question. This is from Preeti P. Mittal. What is I just answered her question. Oh, okay. I'm Preeti Mittal, I just answered it on the chat box. Oh, okay. Fantastic. <laughs> This chat box is amazing because you can you can see people's comments and all that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I had a question for you. Just because you told me you hired Aditya Ghosh, so I wanted to know uh, why did you uh, have to uh, hire um, somebody in the airline business to a business where, again, Fab India being a customer sensitive and a centric business. So what synergies or what similarities do you see between an airline and clothes that people wear or home decor? Sorry, I, Preeti Singh, I put it on the chat box, but Preeti Singh, she can't see my answer. Can you see my answer? I addressed it to all panelists. So Preeti, it's, uh, he's given uh, the reply is that um, he, you can send your catalog to mdo at fabindia.net. He'll refer it to the jewelry buyer. I've copied it to her. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. I, I Because I, when I reply to all panelists, I'm assuming that everybody can see it. So um, they, they can't, the, uh, or the panelists can't see the replies. So somebody will have to maybe change the settings on the chat box. Yeah. Or whoever's uh, managing the, whoever's the host might have to change the settings, but. We'll do that. Okay. To go back, uh, Riku, to your question. Priya. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Priya, I'm sorry. Um, we had, uh, I saw the way he scaled up the airline and I've known Aditya and I've, we've attended some workshops together and I got to know him through those workshops. And, and I realized that he, his passion was in execution. And, uh, and though, though his specialization was in the airline business, he, um, he started his career as a lawyer actually. And his passion was in execution. And he also had a very strong uh, desire to work in an area where, which is with a, a social purpose. And that's why we always stayed in touch because he was always excited about Fab India's vision, mission, and, and our values. And, and he is someone who from, I think from his childhood had had this zeal to make a difference in the world and do something which has a very strong social element or dimension to it. And I think that's what attracted him to us. And then what, what we needed was someone who had the ability to execute an idea and take it from you know 10 to a million. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question from Vinita. Uh, so love Fab Cafe, especially the gluten-free dishes. Appreciate that um, you have started this. So that's uh, more of a feedback. I think if we go through the chat, there are certain questions which have commonalities here, which is around women entrepreneurs and small startups and ventures, which have obviously, you know, suffered during the pandemic period due to, uh, you know, obviously the reverse uh, economic downturn. So they're all asking, saying, do you have any suggestions or advice to entrepreneurs like us? Um, it's a, this is a very tough question because um, there's been such a shrinkage in consumer demand during the lockdown period. I think one of the places where we have found We've been able to get some assistance for a lot of our vendors is through the government MSME scheme, the Ministry of Micro, uh, Small and Medium Enterprises, uh, you know, under the under the minister Nitin Gadkariji has come up with some, some really innovative ideas uh, and that is championed to help my, especially micro and small enterprises. And we've in fact, uh, the, uh, many of our vendors have been assisted by these schemes that the government has come up with. There are also some banks there are also some schemes that banks are doing on moratoriums and all but i think the hardest thing for an entrepreneur is that the the demand has shrunk and that's hard because people are just buying fewer products and and being very careful about what they spend their money on so um the, my sense would be in, in a time like this um would be to try to uh get to as many channels as possible for your product uh, you know and Fortunately, there are a lot of new channels opening up um, also because of reliance coming in and there's been a, a big move. There's been a number of more channels on e-commerce where you can sell your product and all. So, um, you know, that would be my advice, but it is a very, very difficult time right now. And, and I hope it, it ends soon. Thank you. 
I sent my message out to Preeti and to the others, uh, yes. uh, and I hope um, I hope it got through this time uh, because I think maybe the first time there was some problem. So Priya, can you see it now? Yeah, I, I can, and uh, oh. I think also people have confirmed that they'll share it again if, in case she doesn't get. Sonu, you're muted. You need to unmute yourself. No, I was saying that when Vic William was talking about the. Uh, platforms, I was saying that you have to look at newer and newer markets and you have to find, you have to find sources to these new markets. It's not easy. I mean, we just set up a, a platform for the galleries and it's not been easy at all. And you have to find... Do we have any more questions? We'll send the email ID, I think, to everybody. I can just send it to the chapters because uh, the member who'd asked was from Bangalore. So I can always send it. And Flo yes, Bangalore has, has just confirmed that people have confirmed that they can see it now, what I'm posting. So okay. Okay. You see, there was some hitch earlier. It's now opened up. So great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Rinku and Priya, thank you so much. This has been such fun. It's been such a lively group. And uh, it's been really... Fun and you know if you write to me, I can promise you'll get a reply. It might not be, it I might not be able to solve your problem, but you know if I can help because I, I think um, anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur, one should really help them. I've been helped in the past by people when I got started in business, and I feel that the one thing I can do is help people who are starting themselves with ideas. So, but it's been great fun. So thank you and um, thank you, thank you so much, William. It was fantastic. It was absolutely lovely. People Great. are asking if you can be a mentor. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> can you be a mentorship? Uh, uh, you know, can you be a part of our mentorship? So just wanted to check on that. <laughs> we discuss that with you offline, Riku. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you on that. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, you would like to. Will you yeah. just a second? Two minutes. Yes. Yes. Sri, yes. So, what a thanks. So after. You. After years of hard work, Fab India has almost become an outlet for all Indian craft lovers to indulge. So there's a mindset that is hinged with uh, dealing with organic products. Like Without our knowledge, we add an impoverished personality to artisans and uh, craftsmen. But Fab India has demolished that perspective and added so much panache to homegrown products. William, the role you have played in bridging rural talent with urban market whilst being a socially responsible, successful company. Sounds almost like a fairy tale. And you have truly made our country fab with the uh, brand that you have created. And your journey was so inspiring. And those were great tips for budding entrepreneurs about the purpose of the idea and to make money is not enough, unit level economics, and to always see the customer with fresh eyes even as you grow. So brilliant. And the customer care could be seen in how many times you kept asking if the email, you know, the message you had sent reached everyone. So I urge you to write a book with all your milestone moments and it will really encourage a lot of young craft pruners to pop up. Now that, uh, you know, RPM is propagating Make in India, but you have been working on it since 1990 and today your dream has come true and this is truly marvelous. And Sharon, what can I say? You are brilliant, as always, in bringing out the best in the conversation and your passion for art is ubiquitous in the questions that you ask. Thank you, Sharon. Thank and you. GB members, past chairs, past presidents, and members of Flow, thank you for your support. And I thank the members of the press for making our work seem more meaningful. And we owe much to Satyabama University, Kredai Chennai, and Radiant Group, who have graciously sponsored the session. Thank you once again, William. And thank you once again, Sharon. Thank you all. And uh, we'll see you again at our next session on the 17th. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, William. You. See you soon. Stay well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye. Thank you, girls. Sonu, super That's, session. Thank you. That was lovely. I think today you learned to bounce off and bounce back. I, I know. I don't know what happened to my internet. Suddenly, everything was like... <laughs> Anyway, thank you. Thank you, really good. thank you, Jayashree. That was very good. And I think William is really so generous with his information. And it would be nice if he can be part of our mentorship also. And it was actually, nice. Actually, you know, Rinku, he Rinku so had this well. conversation.
I you should I you should take this because you know people like this bring a lot i mean you know that advice daily thing that he's talking about 